really glad you're here. We're, we're in a series called More or Less, uh, More or Less, and there's some things we wish we had more of and some things we wish we had less of, and today we're going to talk about regret, and how many just wish you had more regret? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. Most of us don't want more of that. Uh, most of us feel like we have too much of it now. We're going to take a peek into a very complicated story, but it yields unbelievable insights into what regret is, what it does, and what can be done about it. And it's, uh, we're starting in 2 Samuel chapter 18, where it says, while David, this is King David, he's the second king of Israel, was sitting between the inner and outer gates. The watchman went up to the roof of the gateway by the wall, and he looked out and saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported it. The king said, if he's alone, it must, he must have good news. And the runner came closer and closer, and the watchman saw another runner and called down to the gatekeeper, look, another man running alone. And the king said, he must be bringing good news too. The watchman said, it seems to me that the first one runs like a Himaez. Now, he must have quite, been quite the runner. If you can just from a long way off see, see who that is. And the king says he's a good man and he comes with good news. And then Ahimehaz called uh, to the king, all is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, Praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hands against my lord the king. And the king asked, Is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimehaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me, your servant but I don't know what it was. King said, stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, my lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. And the king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, may the enemies of my lord the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. And the king was shaken. And he went to a room over the gateway and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It's one of the most heart-wrenching statements in David's life, and that's saying something, because this guy lived life to the full in a lot of areas. But this is not just the grief or only the grief of a father who's lost a son. This is a very complicated story. Um, Absalom, if you met him, you probably would have liked him. He was one of those guys who was good-looking, and he knew it. And uh, he wore great clothes and drove a magnificent chariot. He'd fit right in today, wouldn't he? He knew how to make an entrance. He actually would have 50 young men run ahead of him as he moved his chariot into any area just to make an entrance. And when people would fall down to, to uh, bow down and show respect to him, he would run right over and pick them up and say, oh, you don't have to do that to me. Just, just think about that. It it's, feels like a little bit of a conflict. A guy who makes that entrance and then says, no, no, don't make a big deal about me. He, he's a very charismatic guy, and he won the hearts of just about everyone he interacted with. Another thing about him is he took just about every opportunity he had to throw his father under the bus or under the chariot, as the case may be. He insinuated that David didn't have the time or the attention to provide justice to those who need it. A lot of people would line up hoping for an appointment with the king, and you can imagine only a few would get in, and he would just stand outside and talk to those who felt like things weren't fair, and he would just say, I wish... I could be delegated some authority because I would make sure your case gets heard and justice would be done, but that's not how things are run now. Now, you might think this is the behavior of just a rich, spoiled royal, but the story is even more complicated than that. Absalom had a sister. Her name was Tamar. And Tamar was raped by their half-brother. His name was Amnon. And after that occurred... Absalom kept waiting for their father 
to do something about it. Two years went by, not one word said. Nothing done. That exceeded the limitation of what Absalom was willing to wait, and so he created a circumstance in which his half-brother Amnon would be murdered. And after he succeeded at the death of his half-brother, he left the country for three years. It took a lot of complicated negotiations and conversations to get him back into the country, but even when he came back into the country for two years, David would not allow him in the palace or in his presence. By the time they actually saw each other, the damage seems as though it could not be undone. Absalom then led a civil war against his father, and it was remarkably successful at the start. David actually had to flee the palace in order to save his own life. But David still had loyal soldiers, and he still had a remarkable set of military strategy skills. And so he was able to turn the tide and be victorious over this force that tried to unseat him from the throne. In the process, Absalom dies. And these are David's soul-wrenching words. He just re keeps repeating his son's name over and over again. And he keeps saying, I wish I had died instead of him. This is not just grief of loss, as though that would not be significant enough. It's regret. There were things that have happened and didn't happen, and you can't change that now. When they study, when they do studies with people, they find that 90% of people who respond in studies say they have a significant regret in their life. That means if there's 10 people in your row, there's only one who doesn't. We carry regret around with us. And regret comes in a couple of forms. One is kind of obvious. The first is something we have done. Maybe it's something we said that we wish we hadn't, or vows that we violated, promises that we broke, things that we took by force or by deceit instead of by paying for them, addictions that we surrendered to. Those memories can haunt us. Those, those, we replay those incidents over and over in our minds. And, and one of the great challenges is in our regret, we often try to justify what it is that we did. We, we tell other people, if you were in that situation, you'd have done the same thing. All I can tell you is I've never seen anyone try to justify their actions and experience forgiveness. When we're arguing that what we did wasn't that bad, we never really feel forgiven. And so that's kind of the more obvious form of regret that I think we've all had some experience with. There's a less obvious form of regret, and that is, involves things that we have not done, things that we wish we had done some point where we had the opportunity to, to stand up or speak out, and instead we stood still, still and was silent. We didn't declare our love to someone. We didn't offer forgiveness to someone. We didn't submit the application or send the resume. Our failure was not an act committed. It was an act omitted. And those memories haunt us too. We think over and over again, what could my life have been like if only I had? And what I will tell you, and for some of you this will be the bad news of the morning, the older you get, the worse it gets. So how are we to navigate this? Well, we're, you know, when it comes to missed opportunities, where do these missed opportunities mostly show up? And the first, they mostly show up in areas where we could have acted to advance our potential. There was an opportunity to do something that would sharpen our skills, increase our capacities, develop more of who we are, or, or step into something that we feel would have made a difference. And we all have a, a lot more potential than we realize or that we calculate, but the key to unlocking potential usually comes in the form of commitment. There's just something we have to do. There's something we have to take on, and there's something we have to do over and over again. Uh, we have to commit to complete our studies. We have to commit to show up to practice. Commitment actually allows you to achieve things that you couldn't just do because it's easy or convenient. And your skills wind up getting developed, and they get sharpened. 
But I will tell you that commitment can sometimes feel like suffering. It, it gets hard and uh, not very enjoyable sometimes. And certainly, going through that doesn't guarantee an opportunity, but when the opportunity comes, you do feel better prepared for it. King David actually didn't have a lot of regret about missed opportunities for advancing his potential. This was a guy who was multi-skilled. He knew how to do a lot of things really well. He had spent thousands of hours learning to practice a musical instrument and writing songs. He had spent thousands of hours practicing hurling stones with a sling until he could hit pretty much anything he aimed at. He spent thousands of hours learning how to organize, administrate, and lead others. He was one of the truly great leaders of the entire Old Testament. And he spent thousands of hours learning how to discern God's voice some of the most nuanced prophetic insights given in all of Scripture show up in the Psalms just from something that he's sensing God's heart speak to him. But, so, or so, David didn't have a lot of regrets from missed opportunities to advance his potential. Like he did all of those things really well. There's another area, and that's addressing a problem. Missed opportunities to address a problem. David's son, Amnon, had done a horrible thing but David didn't know how to handle it. He was at a loss about what options to exercise or how to start the conversation. So the person who was one of the best poets and songwriters in history was unable to talk to his own kids. And when Absalom took matters into his own hands, David still didn't know what to say or how to start. The conversation. He didn't say a word. He didn't knock on anybody's bedroom door. He never even sent a letter. David grieves the death of his son. But he grieves far more than that. He felt his inability to speak and to act in that time past actually contributed to this horrible tragedy that he's dealing with now. And he shuts down. It's what happens to us when regret gets to be too much. He staggers to a room, and, and he just keeps repeating his son's name and that he wished he had died instead. And this is an interesting thing. Those soldiers who had fought for and with him, they began to feel as though they had done something wrong. And the Bible actually indicates that they began to sneak back into the city as though they were ashamed if they had demonstrated cowardness, cowardliness and escaped the battle in order to spare their own lives. This is what's really astonishing to me. Regret doesn't just impact us. It impacts those around us who are doing good things. This is how powerful this is. And... His words kind of unveil how powerful this regret is in his life. He said, I wish I had died instead of Absalom. He had lost vision for what the kingdom could be. He had lost his resolve to repair the damage that had been done. He's, bring, he's becoming to believe, he's, he's starting to believe that the one who's responsible for, for how this happened, for creating this nightmare, shouldn't be allowed to do anything else. He's beginning to believe that the person who failed to act and to speak and created this nightmare shouldn't be loved and can't be forgiven. Those are the thoughts that are starting to worm their way into his mind. So what options are available for a person who shouldn't be loved and can't be forgiven? And the answer is you just think you're unusable. There's nothing left. David is moving from believing I can't undo this to believing I shouldn't do anything. That's what regret does. This is the horrible, awful, terrible power of regret. Now, a question that came to my mind while I'm working through this. Do you think if David had been given an insight as to how this would all play out, do you think he would have exercised a different option way back in the day when he could have knocked on a bedroom door and started a conversation? And I absolutely think that he would have. I do. Not because he was confident of how the conversation would go. He would just have an understanding of where this can go if I don't act. And th this is what's interesting. I really believe that the values and the guidelines that God gives us 
are intended to help us when we can't foresee all the consequences that will happen when we act out of bounds or fail to act like we should. For example, one of God's commandments is that we, we be honest. We tell the truth. We don't lie. Our deception can lead to unbelievable amounts of regret. And here's the thing. Maybe we did something we're not proud of, and we don't want to acknowledge that to somebody. And so we'll, we'll hide or maybe even distort the truth. And all we can imagine is the disappointment of that person if they find out what's true about me, which is a real thing. But we fail to imagine what that person will do when they find out not only did you, you did that, but you lied about it. That's the picture we don't see. So God just says, tell the truth. His commands are actually to help us when we can't foresee the consequences of things. So how do you learn to recover from regret? I should probably move on to that because it feels like this is getting a little bit heavy. And first is learn to focus on God's faithfulness rather than your failure. It's easy to imagine that you cannot be forgiven because you cannot forget what you have done or what you didn't do. But please understand, God doesn't forgive us because of what we have done for him. God forgives us because of what he has done for us. That's, that's a world of difference. That's a huge thing. Jesus chose to pay the price and take the punishment of all of our sins. That was his decision. He didn't fail to act. He endured every lash of the whip. He endured every hammer-driven nail into his hands and feet. He listened to people say the most insulting things that they could create in their own, on their own lips. He watched his own friends run away. He endured all of that. And you can ask him, do you have any regrets that you went through all of that? And he would look you straight in the eye with a smile on his face and say, I don't have a single regret. It was worth it all was worth it all. When God saw all that Jesus endured, he said it was enough, enough to cover every fault and every failure, every sin that's ever been committed by anyone. And the question I have for you, if it's good enough for God, why wouldn't it be good enough for you? I mean, just think about that. Do you really want to get in an argument and tell God that what he did was not enough? Do you really want to make the case that your sin is greater than his sacrifice? I don't think that's a good argument to make. This is what's astonishing to me. I don't know anything like this. I've, I've tried to find another connection anywhere, and I can't find it. But this was what seems to be true. If you want to escape the power of regret, connect to the one who has none. That's an astonishing thing to me. Uh, the second thing is turn a missed opportunity to a new opportunity. You can't undo the past, but we can learn something valuable from it. So there are lessons that we learn about ourselves, about our world. This is what I will tell you. It's always better to learn those lessons through the lens of grace than through the lens of regret. We need to be honest about what we did or what we failed to do. So what kinds of things can we learn about ourselves? Well, you might learn you're a little bit selfish. I won't ask you to self-disclose, but how many would raise your hand and say you believe the person next to you is capable of being selfish? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Some of you are regretting raising your hand right now, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, so now you know you're selfish. Now you know you will take when you have the opportunity. Now you know that you will fail to give something when you had the chance. And now that you know that, if you can see that through the lens of you have been forgiven and that you are loved, because that's what regret does, right? It tells us we shouldn't be loved and we can't be forgiven. And God comes through the lens of grace and he says, I know what you did, and I love you, and I forgive you.
Now, here's what's fascinating is once you learn that lesson through the lens of grace, when another opportunity comes up to be generous or to share, you actually exercise different options than if you were living through regret because when you, when you live through regret, this is what we do to ourselves. Well, I'm a selfish person. That's all I've ever been. I'll never do anything worthwhile. And that mental loop we get into keeps us from ever exercising a different option in our life. But if you know that's how you've acted in the past, and this is a tendency that I have, but God has loved me and God has forgiven me, now when I see that kind of situation come up again, I have different options. I'm not just repeating my past. I'm changing my future. And it is all because of grace. Uh, maybe you know that acknowledging something to someone is going to disappoint them. And, and so truthfulness can take a hit. If you know you're loved and you know you are forgiven, you find the strength to actually speak the truth. If, if, you, if you're afraid to declare your love to someone, uh, it's so easy to think, well, if I ever say I love them and they don't say it back to me, that that would destroy me. Okay. I, I, I imagine that that would be an incredibly painful thing. But that's because we don't imagine what it is like to look through our hollowed, regret-filled eyes through someone else while they are trying to love us and only imagining what life could have been if we had said something to someone else. It's unbelievable what regret does to us. So, and this is the thing, the people who are trying to love us, they often feel ashamed as though they're getting it wrong. So here's the question I would ask you. I'll just go ahead and call worship team up. If you are feeling unusable, like there are things that God would never do for, in, or through your life, it is highly likely that regret is driving that conversation. And what I can tell you is our culture will never let you off the hook on that. Our culture doesn't tell you you need to feel less regret. They tell you you need to feel more. And unless you feel even worse about what you've done, you will never change. And what I will tell you is I've never seen anyone change because of regret. But I've seen lots of people change because of grace. It does not fail. It's not just letting someone off the hook. That's not what grace is. Grace reminds you how much you're loved. Grace reminds you how much you're forgiven. Grace reminds you you do have different options to exercise if you believe those first two things. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, so I've been doing pastoral ministry a long time and I've heard a lot of stories that people trusted me with I've watched hands tremble and tears stream down cheeks and they would do anything to be able to turn the clock back to exercise a different option than the one that they did. And there's no option for that. Time travel is not a thing. But grace is. And the grace of God is greater than anything you've done or the regret that you carry. For some of us this morning, there are prayers we won't even pray because we think we are so undeserving. And maybe that's part of what God wants to do in your life today, to give you enough grace to dare to pray a brave prayer because God has not timed you out or tapped you out. He's come to release you into your full potential. So Father, would you help us today? We carry this around every moment of our lives. There are moments when it seems so overwhelming we don't know if we can breathe would you help us today to know that your grace can breathe life into us and we can breathe that out to others 
all the days you give to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand with me this morning.